What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by Bet MGM. This is the Final Four college basketball betting preview. I'm stuck in joining me today for this episode are my fellow PBOC callers, Mike Calabrese and Mike Randall. Mike and Mike, we got the Final Four set. Unfortunately for the podcast, no repeat with our future after hitting UConn last year. Hopefully some profited a bit off of the Clemson Final Four future that we had. But the most disappointing moment of the tournament for me was when Jamal Shedd went down. Uh, I really believe Houston had a good shot. And uh, I think they were going to get to the title game. If he didn't go down, uh, the path was there with NC State waiting and uh, just an unfortunate injury, which was the story of the season for Houston, man. Uh, team just couldn't stay healthy and their most important player goes down. And that was just uh, devastating for Houston, devastating for our future. But we march on before we get to the final four. I'll just get your guys' thoughts on the tournament so far. Uh, pretty. I, I've had a bad tournament betting wise. I had one good day that like saved me. Had a big round robin. That was a, about it. Um, I I'm kind of disappointed in the final four to be honest because we got no upsets early, right? And then the good thing with that is that you usually get very good matchups and games later on. I thought the Sweet Sixteen Elite Eight a little underwhelming. Um, it's from like a, just an entertainment and thrill factor. And then now we have two near double digit spreads in the final four, which uh, is pretty wild. If you go, if you combine the spreads right now, which is close to what, 21, this would be the highest combined spreads in the final four since the, uh, since seeding began. So we don't even have on paper amazing final four matchups the houston and the shed injury with houston really hurts there what can save the tournament though and as is always the case is a great final four and especially a great national championship and if chalk holds that would be between purdue and yukon so pretty just overall just an underwhelming tournament so far for me uh just like from an entertainment standpoint and you know it's not the greatest final four i thought i was expecting better things after the chalky start but here we are and we're going to try to find some winners and uh especially talk some props too and uh we'll also be back on sunday night monday morning for the national title preview where we'll talk whatever matchup it is and we'll break down some props there but i'm curious to get you guys just overarching thoughts on the tournament so far randall i'll start with you yeah, favorites and public sort of nailing each game takes the drama out of the tournament. Listen, I thought they did a terrible job seeding. We discussed this. It felt like they seeded it three days prior. Maybe they're overwhelmed and they don't want to make that many changes. But um, the game we wanted was auburn Yukon in the East, and we did not get that uh, because the ejection with the elbow, which shouldn't have been an ejection. And then, you know, they just fold and they're not able to stop Polakitis down the stretch. We knew the West bracket was going to be the blow-up bracket. Clemson almost got all the way to the end, but Alabama got hot. The reason that this isn't really a sexy Alabama team is because they don't play defense and everybody just relies on the three. The other brackets, we talked to South, it was Shed. Shed's injury changed the game. There is no reasonable opposite. It changed the whole tournament. It changes it. Because if Shed, they lost by three without Shed. I mean, enough, guys. He's one of the best players in the country. They win that game, and they probably beat NC State. And listen, I think NC State, I think Stuck will have a good championship game. I assume UConn is going to win. I know everybody's nuts about the plane travel. Enough with that. These are college kids. It's two days from now. But I think we'll have a compelling story because either we'll have Purdue versus UConn, which should be a really good matchup, or we'll have Cinderella and NC State rolling in against UConn. So that should be pretty good. The one that bothered me off also was the Vescovi flu thing. He's critical to what Tennessee does. If he's totally healthy, I, I believe they beat Purdue. I know he's not a big scorer. He's not a 15, 16 per game scorer, but he's an elite defender, can easily get two to four steals every game gets into the lane and sets up people for other shots. Adu had a terrible game. Only one was connect. So the external forces really bother me because it's changed the way the tournament is. But 
we get Purdue, UConn is going to be great. And if we get an NC State team that actually keeps it close to UConn, that's going to be compelling as well. So that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, it's, it, for me, it's hard to see NC State staying in the same gym as UConn. Uh, you would just have Klingon taking away Burns, and I, I don't know how NC State would get stops. And, uh, I mean, that spread would be uh, one of the highest we've ever seen in a national title. For what it's worth, in the past 60 years of the Final Four, this is the second highest as far as spreads, combined spreads in the Final Four. The highest was in 1972 with UCLA and UNC. And over the past 60 years, during that time span, 12 teams have closed above an 11-point favorite, which is where UConn sits now. Eight of the 12 were UCLA, that dominant UCLA team, between 1964 and 1973. In the championship, NC State 1974 was actually a 12-point favorite versus Marquette, and they pushed. But since then, since seeding expanded in 1985, we've seen three favorites of more than 12 points in the semifinals or later. All of them won, but it's only it's only happened three times, but none of them covered. We saw it's hard to it's hard to remember Gonzaga 2021 over UCLA, but they were a 14 point favorite. Uh they ended up winning by three in that thrilling game. Kentucky in the national championship was a 14 point favorite over Syracuse. In 1996, they won by nine. And Duke in 1999, in the Final Four, was an 11.5-point favorite over Michigan State. They won by six. Calvary, curious to get your thoughts on uh, the tournament so far before we get into uh, the Final Four and breaking those games down. And Yeah, I, I will echo before you – just to jump in. Yeah, and Ziegler had an awful day for Tennessee to, like, connect. If that was a fun game, uh, like just seeing Edie and Connect going back and forth. Uh, but Connect ultimately just get, he could, didn't get any help. Uh, Ziegler couldn't hit a shot. He couldn't even make a free throw in the first half. And Adu, I mean, talk about a disappearing act. Uh, he looked lost out there. But Calabrese, what are your thoughts on the, the tournament so far? Yeah, I agree. I thought we traded off the early upsets for some really compelling matchups, and they just didn't materialize. I, fe I feel just sick for Shed and Houston because they deserved – at least the way that they played for the entire season, the way that they weathered the injuries that they had, I think they deserve to be in the final four. It would certainly make for a better matchup here. And this is kind of what the, the push and pull with college football, talking about expanding the playoff and you get to determine it on the field or on the court. And that makes it legitimate. The bigger the field in a single elimination situation, the crazier things can go. I understand those are two separate sports, but certainly in basketball, None of us are going to sit here and say pre-tournament six weeks ago, Alabama is a top five team in the country. Not to take it away from them. They haven't won with smoke and mirrors. They've made their shots. They played a little bit better on defense. I think that they can make things interesting, at least for half. I'll get to that in terms of my prop bet that I like the most in the semifinal. But on the NC State side of things, like I'm not even sure there's people inside the NC State athletic department that really thought that there was a second weekend run, let alone a, a run to the final four. Everything that needed to click right for them. It's a great story, and I'm happy for them, but I think we're, it takes away from these semifinals, certainly, in terms of these two teams. All of that being said, you can wipe it all away. If we get a great title game between UConn and Purdue, and it's a one-possession game one way or the other, and we end up getting a classic out of it, I think it can salvage the memory of this tournament. But at this point, it's it has been underwhelming. On a personal note, I stuck my neck out, you know, with all my lipsy slander. He played fine. I was there up in Boston. What a great game. I was lucky to be at one of the few great games of the entire tournament against Illinois, but at least they don't make a deep run and make me look like a fool. And then, you know, it, it wasn't that Rick Barnes was out coached. It wasn't that Tennessee was fraudulent in any way, shape or form. They just got beat by a Purdue team that for a while, I feel like I've been the only one flying the banner for Matt Painter and Purdue. I think everyone's at least narrative wise been waiting for the the bottom to fall out. He's had, you know, career struggles in after the first weekend in the NCAA tournament, but this Purdue team just seems, I think because of they're in the shadow of UConn who is playing, it's just such a killer level. They, they're the way that they're playing makes 91 UNLV look like, you know, a merciful team, which they were not. UConn is just playing this bloodthirsty brand of basketball. They're so motivated. I'm interested to see if any of the travel has any effects on them or not, but Overall, I think Purdue's 
sustained level of excellence really for the entirety of the season is overshadowed a bit by UConn. I think in a normal year, we'd be looking at them as, is this, you know, one of the best teams of the last 10 years with a two-time national player of the year? You look at Evan Mia's stats and everything that he puts in to, to, you know, historical perspective on Edie's performance. I agree. This guy has just played so well. He's been able to, you know, essentially put the team on his back at times. And for that reason, I'm just praying that we get UConn Purdue in the national title. It's the one ticket that I bought and from a futures perspective for this tournament. I got Purdue at uh, plus 650 to win it all. I think I'll hedge certainly a little bit if they do get to Monday night. Um, but overall, that's what I'm hoping for because I do think a classic vintage national title game will you know, essentially erase some of the issues that we had with not getting great buzzer beaters, not getting Cinderella's, and getting some flat performances and what should have been good matchups. All right, well, let's get into said games and we will start with the first tip off 609 eastern on tbs between nc state the 11 seed and the number one seed purdue boilermakers for what it's worth nc state an 11 seed team seeded ninth or lower in the final four oh and nine straight up three and six against the spread they will look to become the first team to make the championship seated this low or high, however you look at it. Purdue is a nine and a half point favorite here. Total sitting at one forty six. Uh, you know, to me, look if you look at NC State, you got to give them credit for the run that they're on. They won five games in five days to win the ACC tournament and get into the dance, and they've obviously won four straight in the tournament. But they've definitely been fortunate. Uh, you saw Marquette just couldn't make a wide open shot. You know, if you look at a site like Shot Quality, Shot Quality has NC State's of their past six wins, five of them graded as losses. Over their past eight games, of which they've won them all, teams are shooting 26% from three. No one can make a three against them. Prior to that stretch, they were outside the top 300 in three point defense. Does all of that come crashing down against Purdue? Uh, I lean Purdue here. I, I just think that, you know, DJ Burns has been incredible, and this has been talked about a lot. He just won't have the strength advantage down low, and Edie's length is going to be such a problem. I, I like Burns under points, too, especially if you could buy a 50, maybe a 15 and a half out there. He's gone under that number. 28 of 40 games this year. Only averaged 13 points per game. And he's not going up against a guy with Edie's length every day. Uh, this is a totally different animal that he's going up against. And here's the thing. There's an enormous risk for foul trouble. And NC State isn't particularly deep. And, you know, there's these two schools of thoughts with Purdue. You'll hear a lot of, like, casual recreational fans will say, I hate watching Edie. The, the, the fouls are ridiculous. And then you have like the college basketball media. That's like uh, Edie is a God. Like they have, they defend everything he does. Uh, it's as always, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Like Edie gets fouled all the time. He's, he's very big, but there's also times I thought in the Tennessee game, they just missed a couple fouls on him, right? Uh, there was a push off. There was an elbow. So um, it's, it, he's very difficult to officiate. Um, he definitely gets fouled all the time. Just look at his arms. Uh, but because he's so big, he fouls too. And sometimes he, he gets away with some fouls. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It's not like uh, he just gets all the calls and it's not like he's flawless. Um, so I, I always get entertained by watching the those two narratives on Twitter going back and forth. But uh, I think that Edie has a very good chance of getting NC State into foul trouble. Purdue, I, look, if anyone is going to hit that regression, that looming regression for NC State. It's Purdue, one of the top three-point shooting teams in the country. A couple other props that I like are uh, Gillis over threes, Lawyer over threes, like one and a half are uh, prop extraordinaire, the prop docker Nick Giffen. He makes them like one seven, one eight around there. I think you can get plus money on both over one and a half three-pointers. Uh, but because I think that NC State they're not going to be able to single coverage. Like they like to just use a lot of single coverage. They're not going to do that here. And 
I think that NC State, which is – they press at a very high rate for the whole season. They haven't been doing it as much, uh, especially in the ACC tournament. And then, you know, they don't they – don't the, they're not deep. And they were on this crazy run. They had to save their legs. But now you get, you know, some time off before the Final Four. I think that the, we might see some press here from NC State. Try to pressure produce guards into mistakes. But I think that's going to lead to some transition threes. You've heard Painter talk a lot about wanting to get out and transition more. And then they're going to have to collapse on Edie. Like, you can't afford to guard him one-on-one. You also can't afford to get in foul trouble. And I think that's going to lead to a lot of kicked-out threes. Um, And I think Lawyer and Gillis can take advantage. And uh, another one that's been talked about a lot is Braden Smith over assists. uh, Over six-and-a-half assists I really like, too. Uh, But I I like Purdue here. I I make this closer to 11, 11 11-and-a-half. And if the threes are falling for Purdue, I think it might be the end of the end of the run for NC State. But they're on some magic carpet ride. Everything just seems to go their way. Burns has been incredible. Um, but I think the run ends here. Red, I'll throw it to you first. What are you seeing in NC State Purdue? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm taking I'm taking the points with NC State. I I've I'm done doubting them. The problem with Edie, because you've seen teams like Wisconsin be successful against them. What you have to do against Edie is you got to hold that box out. And Tennessee didn't do that. Tennessee would box him a little and then release to get the ball. And he just got the ball every single time. So I do think this. How they also got in foul trouble, which was they, not helpful. They did because they didn't have a big that had to do anything against Edie also. So I think Burns is passing. Diara, I think, needs to stay on the floor. I know one of my favorite props is Diara under 10 and a half rebounds. Because when he goes against a team with a significant big, he doesn't have that. Doesn't mean he's not effective. Just means that he's not going to be able to grab his normal amount of rebounds. They have to do some things on offense on the interior to keep Edie occupied, and they have to hold the box out. It's almost as if stuck. The guy boxing out Edie should not worry about getting the ball because if you release, it's a jump ball, and Edie's getting it every single time. I do think they'll be able to do a little bit more on the interior. And listen, I need some luck. I need a player such as Jaden Taylor who is a 36, 37% three-point shooter, yet has gone seven straight games with eight points or less. Prior to that, he had 18, 18, 28. I need him to get hot from three. I think they'll be able to guard the perimeter decently well. I think they'll be able with Horn and Morcel to attack off the dribble. So I need a couple things to go my way, but it's a lot of points here. It's an awful lot of points. And I do think that they're not going to want to foul out Burns right away. They're going to want to keep this game. They're going to play a little bit. So if Burns and Diara can do and at least keep Edie somewhat limited, I'm talking 23 points, 24 points, not 35 or 40, I think they can stay in it. It's a lot of points. I get that. Haven't been impressed with the Purdue shooting. I know you think that's coming, but I think Jaden Taylor is also coming as well. So I'll take the points with NC State. Don't feel great about it. And I feel like if you want to bet Purdue, how I would bet them is on the money line to win the national title would be my suggestion because I don't want to worry about the nine here. And I think you can probably get them at a better number than you would get them in the championship game. What would you make stuck that championship game at UConn and Purdue? Would you make it four? What would you make it? Yeah, three, three and a half, four. Three and a half, four. So they're not going to be plus 230 where you can get them, 220, whatever it is to win the title. So that's my suggestion on how to bet it. If you like Purdue, just bet them for the title. But I think NC State can keep it close. I, I do. Um, but I'm going to need some things to go my way. If Purdue's shooting the lights out and I don't get a good game from Taylor, this is going to be a rough one. Yeah. I mean, maybe the like market-wise, it could you could some ratings would have it like three. Now, it depends on what these two teams do Saturday. Like, if UConn rolls again, by the way, they're 10-0 and 0 against the spread. They've been up by 30 in every tournament game. They went on a 30 to nothing run. A 30 to nothing run against Illinois in the Elite Eight. Villanova, I know, went on a 25 nothing run against Oklahoma in the final. Remember that game, the Final Four? And like, yeah, with Buddy Hill. Yeah, with Buddy Hill. They, they won like 90, yep. I think they won like 95 to 58, 25 nothing run. A 30 to nothing run against an offense like Illinois is insane. <laughs> it's insane. So if Connecticut rolls again, like, and this is a national title, public is going to, you know, can have a say here. And who's, you know, lining up to bet against UConn. Everyone's betting the national title. So you could get some, you know, inflation uh, on the UConn line. Like, you know, if UConn was minus three, you're going to have the whole world trying to bet that. Um, so I would think it would be potentially a little higher. Um, 
because UConn is just an absolute wagon. We'll get to them in a second. But I, I do think that, like, the foul, you know, it sucks to talk about because it's look, that's, that's basketball. A lot of these games come down to random shooting variants. And in this case, when you're dealing with Edie, it's going to come down to fouls, when they happen, to who they happen. Like, if Edie, Edie you get in foul trouble, too, and that changes the complexion of the game. Um, you know, if he's trying to guard Burns early and Burns, you know, twists and turn, turns and gets him uh, a foul, and then there's, like, an offensive foul, and he has two fouls five minutes into the game, changes the entire game. But the reason it's so critical for NC State, and the reason I think they have to help on Edie, is they're only going seven. They only go seven deep. Like that, that's they they play their starting five. They put bring in Taylor and then Middlebrooks um, comes in and he's been playing really well. But that's it. So like you got the seven guys. That's all they're playing with. And they just saw Zach Eady go for forty. Like you can't. So they're gonna say. I think what they have to do is all right. We can't go single coverage because we're gonna get fouled. We're not deep. We can't let him beat us. So in the half court, I think they have to live with Purdue's shooting. Right. You you, you got to say. We're going to take away Edie. We're going to help on him. We're going to double him. Uh, we're going to trap. And you got to live with Purdue jump shots. I think that's the what Keats has to think here. Uh, you can't just let Edie dunk and get his bigs into foul trouble, just like they did against Tennessee. Um, so I think after seeing that game last week, that's got to be the approach. I think it's going to open up some opportunities on the perimeter. And I think it's basically going to come down to Purdue's guards and uh, you know, Edie's still going to get his, but can they hit those threes? And we'll see if per- maybe NC State, which maybe one of the reasons under Nevada is they don't turn it over. Um, so like they're they're not giving away extra possessions, but we'll see if they can actually force Purdue into some turnovers, up their press rate, um, and we'll see if that's a means to some quick and easy buckets. But Calvary's, what are you seeing here? One thing you guys haven't touched on yet, and this isn't news for Final Four, but of course they're playing it in a football stadium for no good reason. You know, they could play it in a basketball arena, but instead they want to pack the seats. So they're playing at State Farm Stadium. Does that have any impact on the shooting? There's been all kinds of studies back and forth. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. They've overinflated the basketballs. At least that's what my eyes tell me at some of these venues. And you've seen teams all of a sudden, who you know, who should be knocking down wide open threes, not being able to throw it in the ocean. So that at least is on the table. And it's one of the reasons why I feel good about Purdue winning. I'm actually staying away. I think this number is right on my power rankings in terms of the spread. But what I like is, yes, they're going to at times double ED and they're going to work the ball around. It's one of the reasons that Purdue is top 30 nationally in open three-point rate. And they shot 42% from deep in Big Ten play. So they're capable of making it. The thing about it, though, is where you look across the bracket and you look at a team like Alabama, if their threes aren't going in, there's no backup plan that's actually going to lead them to victory. Whereas for the Boilermakers, they shot three for 15 against Tennessee, but they had other plans in place. They scored 21 points on 22 ball screens in that game, you know, almost a full point per possession in those situations. So at least I know that Painter has something to go to. It's not just we need 35 from Edie or we need to knock down 12 or 13 threes. They have ways to generate offense. So if there are issues with knocking down jump shots, I don't think they're dead in the water. But this is a pass for me in terms of a side. You you mentioned it stuck in terms of Braden Smith's assist numbers. It's my favorite um, prop on the board. I'm actually going to go with him to get eight or more at plus 130 in the market. He finished second nationally in assists per game this season, and he crossed this number eight or more in 18 of his 35 starts this season. NC State also allows assists on 50% of made baskets, which ranks 158th nationally. And then when you look at you know the easy buckets, once he gets in the lane, if he gets it to Edie, he always finishes. He had four assists directly to Edie against the Zags, four more against Tennessee. So I think that's going to be an opportunity for him to cruise past this number. And then finally, if you remove their blowout win against Utah State in the around to 32 and his early exit due to an injury against Michigan state in the big 10 tournament. He's averaged 37 minutes per game dating back to late January. So best ability is availability. He's going to be on the court. Sean Kerner uh, from our predictive analytics department said they have him tabbed for 36 minutes or more in this game. I bet he plays just about every minute. So I like him to hit eight or more at plus one thirty. Yeah. I think uh, Nick Giffen makes this close just under eight. Uh, I like that as well. And especially if I think NC State's going to maybe try to press a little more, as I mentioned. So that could lead to some transition points and some assists in the open floor. So, yeah, I really like Smith over assists. I like some lawyering yellows threes. And I like Burns under because I just think he's been on such a tear 
number is a bit inflated. Like the average is 13 points per game. Now you're now this line is 14 and a half, 15 and a half, you know, especially under 15 and a half is going to about 28 or 40 times foul trouble risk. Um, and he's got to go up against the length of Edie in the paint. Won't be as easy as it has been against some of the other teams that he has faced. Um, yeah, I think that's – do you have any other props you want to mention or anything else, Randall? No, I agree. I, I'm going to be on Taylor. If I Again, I like to marry – we talk about this, the props to how we think the game's going to go. NC State's got to get perimeter scoring, and they have to be able to attack. I mean, Connect was able to do that no problem. Now, uh, the perimeter players, Horn, Connect, guys like that were, are not nearly at the level of, of, uh, of Taylor, like of Connect. But they're going to have to be able to hit some shots. I know it's a football stadium. It's going to be suppressed a little bit, but that's how I'm looking. If I think the game's going to be close, I'm going to be looking to fade a little bit on Edie's total production and to hit the NC State guards on the perimeter if points and three pointers, even though shooting is tough. But we've seen it before. One team can get hot and the other one can struggle. I couldn't believe Oklahoma got blown up by Villanova that night. That was crazy. But that's what NC State's going to need. And it's possible. Villanova Georgetown stuck 85. We've seen it, but we're just going to need some help. Yep. All right, let's move on to the second game, 849 Eastern on TBS between Alabama and UConn. UConn's an 11.5-point favorite here. They're against the spread wagon. Total sitting at 161.5. Look, it's it's hard for me to imagine Alabama getting many stops in this game. The elephant in the room is how many threes can they make? What, they shot 44% over their past two games? They got hot against North Carolina. They got hot against Clemson. Had some unheralded heroes in that one, hitting threes in the second half. They shot 44%. I think in their wins this year, they're like 42, 43% from three. In their losses, they're 27, 28%. A lot of that correlates with their home and away shooting splits in this game. I I will say, look, the UConn's transition D is great, but Alabama – they just went up against two really good transition defenses in Carolina and Clemson, and they were able to score at will. The threes were obviously falling. They're a rim and three offense. I think they shot one mid-range jumper against Clemson. That's problematic against UConn. You're not going to get anything at the rim. Illinois, what were they? 0 of 19 on shots contested by Donovan Klingon, who had just an epic game against the Illini. The UConn drop defense kind of forces you into the mid-range. I mean, Alabama, no one takes fewer mid-range shots in Alabama. I, They're still going to get up their threes. If I'm Nate Oates, you got to try to play fast. You got to score in transition. And I'm saying, we have, I'm, I might ban twos in the half court. Just, we're not going to get, we're not going to stop them. Play smaller, right? You got to play, who cares about your rim defense? You got to play Nelson, who can potentially hit some threes. Pull clinging away from the net from the hoop. And you got to shoot, I don't know, 53s and hope, you know, you in their wins are shooting 43, 44%. You got to hit like, I don't know, what to win this game 16, 17 threes to have a shot. Uh, and even then, it might not be enough because UConn should score at will. I can't lay this number uh, now that it's out to 11 and a half, 12. Uh, but I'm not playing Alabama either. I'm not getting in front of this UConn train. And I think the spread, I think UConn's going to win just because they're going to get so many easy buckets at will. But I think the spread and whether or not Alabama can put a scan to UConn basically just comes down to three-point shooting variance uh, with this number, which I think is about right. And there's just something about this UConn team. They, You know, you would think, oh, they're national title. They're national defending champs. Like, there's going to be some complacency now. Hurley has them every game. They're angry. They're out for blood. They play with a chip on their shoulder. Uh, So you could see, like, if Alabama's threes aren't falling, like, you could see some, a couple kill shots in this game. Maybe not 30 to nothing, but uh, Alabama's going to have to make jumpers here against a team that does a really good job of taking away the three with their length and their scheme on the defensive end. Uh, Jim Root on our, if you haven't listened to the three man weaves final four preview, check that episode out. That's out now. He mentioned Newton over rebounds. I, I, I like that. Um, Alabama's gonna be firing threes. They are a, uh, you know, a bad defensive rebounding team. I think UConn can eat on the offensive glass and 
there's gonna be a lot of long rebounds. Newton can clean those up. And I think that Alabama's gonna, you know, there's gonna be a lot of shots in this game. I think Alabama's gonna try and play faster, try and play with an offensive line lineup, try and just fire threes. Randall, before I see if you will potentially try and lay on the tracks and get in front of this UConn wagon, I do want to mention our Discord. Mention Nick Giffen, Sean Kerner. They basically like giving away money in with their props all tournament, and they'll be doing baseball, every sport, all year round. Join our Discord. I'm going to have a – we're close to 5,000 members. I think we need 200 more or so. Jo- just join it. It's – Pretty cool community. Everyone's sweating together. There's no bots. I'll have a contest this week for a free couple hundred dollars. It'll be something like, you know, who's the leading score of the Final Four, something like that. And what's how many points did that last weekend? So just join the Discord. Super easy to do. Just search Action Network Discord. We'll, we'll put the um, the link in this episode description. But Randall, I'll throw it to you. The Yukon wagon or train. Are you laying on the tracks or are you? Jumping on board. I'm on board. I I can't see a team that has yet to allow more than 58 points in this entire tournament. And a team that just beat Illinois, one of the best offensive teams in the entire nation by 25, yet they only shot three of 17 from three-point range. It's just too much. And I hate... They haven't even been shooting the three well this tournament. What happens when that happens? That's my point. Like, they could blow their doors off here. Alabama, I thought stuck Tennessee was done when Vescovy had the flu, because I just saw this stupid Creighton variant coming through with the threes, and it didn't happen. At some point, you need to do something else. UConn can guard you. UConn can hit the mid-range. UConn can get you in transition, even though they don't play fast. They're great on defense. They're great on the boards. They have depth. They have, what, eight guys that average 12 minutes, uh, 12 minutes per game or more? I can't see it. I just cannot see it at all. I'm laying the points. Nate Oates, great job. They hit a lot of shots. Grant Nelson, I'm looking to fade everyone on the perimeter with Alabama. I think UConn is the real deal. They're legit. They can do it any which way you want, however you want to play. Alabama, I get it. They'd have to hit 60, 65% of their three-pointers. That is not something I want to bet on. They Keep in mind also that when Alabama – that you want to say they beat Clemson, that's fair. They gave up 82 points to Clemson when P.J. Hall fouled out. And a Clemson team that really was what Chase Hunter, basically that was that was their time. And Shefflin, now you're facing a team like Connecticut. How does Connecticut not get to 100 in this game? It's not like Alabama has shown you the ability to play defense. Alabama gave up 87 points to North Carolina, gave up 82 points to Clemson, gave up 96 points to Charleston. Yes, I know a lot was it late in the game, but they're still not playing any defense. UConn has it all. Danny Hurley, chip on his shoulder. They just do too much. I can't take Alabama here. So I'm laying the points with UConn. Yeah, you didn't even mention, yeah, you mentioned Hall fouled out for Clemson. And, you know, Alabama went 16 of 36 from three. You had Jaron Stevenson hit five threes. Um, I got guy who averages five points per game, came off the bench, hit five threes, and scored 19 points. And in that game, it's close all the way until the very end, with Clemson, one of the best free throw shooting teams in the country. A bunch of 80% free throw shooters just brick. They went three of 11 in the second half, 50% for the game. Count, a bunch of one and ones. Uh, some of the free throw shooting in this tournament has been hard. Uh, so Bama definitely was super fortunate in that game. And then the game before, you get you know Grant Nelson uh, going just completely ballistic, which isn't going to happen every day. And yeah, you mentioned UConn's offense, their motion offense. Shout out Tanner McGrath. He has a really good piece out on breaking down the offenses and defenses for each of the Final Four teams. Breaks down their motion offense. It's just a thing of beauty, and they can beat you in so many ways. And I, Bama's going to be lost on that end, trying to defend UConn. And, you know, you mentioned UConn's defense. Castle's been unbelievable. Uh, I mean, he just completely put the cuffs on Shannon, and he's been doing it all season and all tournament. Uh, he's been unbelievable on that end of the floor as a lockdown defender. Calvary, so I'll throw it to you. Are you laying on the tracks? He kind of hinted at it uh, and trying to get in front of this UConn ATM, or are you jumping on board and sticking your card in for some cash? Let's let's go with something a little exotic, a little bit of a flyer, something that's going to pay out 6-1. to one. Could I interest you guys in Alabama winning in the first half and UConn winning the game at six to one? Now, now hear me out here. 
Alabama second nationally in first half points per game at nearly 43. UConn first nationally in second half scoring margin at over eight points per game, actually 8.4. And that's with them emptying their bench. So they just run away from teams late. Their defense puts the vice grip on teams in the second half. Their second and two-point percentage defense, their first nationally and at the rim points per possession allowed. Just overall, we know what the game script's going to be. UConn in the second half is going to get the best of Alabama. But here's the thing. With all the three-point variants, I know they're going to take 35 threes in this game. They're probably going to take 15 to 20 in the first half. I don't need a whole lot to go right in terms of three-pointers falling for Alabama to just inch out and get past them in that first 20 minutes. If they make five or six threes, I think then all of a sudden it becomes a question of how motivated and how hot out of the gates does UConn come in this game? Because you'll get the last one against Illinois. Yes, they had that 30 to run, but you know, that race to 20, they were a little bit sluggish. It looks kind of like a, a game where UConn couldn't, you know, put the ball in the basket or, or Illinois, I should say, but UConn wasn't running away from them right away. And this travel element is a little interesting to me because it's not necessarily just the time zone difference or what the tip off time, but they lost an entire night of sleep where they were like flying in the middle of the night and then checking into the hotels and they're complaining about, you know, the beds are smaller than NC State's beds. I just think there's a chance that they come out a little bit more sluggish than we're used to, because at this point, they've come out absolutely insanely locked in, at least on the defensive end, in every single performance. It made it so difficult for teams to score against them. But Alabama, at least I know the great equalizer being the three point shot. I just got to get lucky. And I think it's six to one feeling incredibly confident that whether Alabama has a one point lead or a 10 point lead at halftime, UConn's going to win this game. UConn are absolute killers. So six to one is the only real long shot bet on the board that I think has piqued my interest because otherwise this game is screaming snoozer to me because I think there's a great chance that if the three zone fall, where is Alabama going to get their points? You get to the hoop, you run into Kling Kong, you get in the mid range. They don't have any practice taking those shots the entire season. And I think from an emotional perspective, they really need that early success just to be viable in the game at all. So I'll go ahead and, and take this double result. I think this is an interesting one. I'd really play it anywhere above five to one. That was my threshold for playing something like this. To see it at six to one, I, I think this has interesting value for a team that potentially could play with nothing to lose. And like at least we know their backcourt is led by an All-American in Sears. Like, yes, they're the underdog. Yes, they're outclassed in a lot of ways. And we see all these different ways that UConn's going to score in the half court. I think that'll matter in the second half when they're closing them out early on. Maybe they can speed up the tempo a little bit. Maybe have it be a tiny bit helter skelter, get some people open in transition, hit some threes. That's the, the game script I'm envisioning. And hopefully I get it. I think I get it more than one out of six times. I think it's going to happen. You know, let's call it 15% of the time they knock down some of those early threes. So I'll go ahead with this prop bet. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you know, when you're looking for something like that, you're looking for variance and you're shrinking the time and you know you're going to get a ton of threes and you don't need them to hit for 40 minutes you just need them to come out hot we've seen you kind of times come out sluggish this year and then they kind of just turn the switch you mentioned the Illinois game it was 23 23 uh then I think it was 53 23 uh which <laughs> is uh was a sight to behold Red, any, any props or anything else you're targeting from this game no still looking at the perimeter players for Alabama uh, I, I do think Klingon's going to clean up on the boards as well. So I'm looking at that. I, I just, it's, it's a role for me and I wouldn't be surprised if you come bloom out. So that gets me a little shaky with the props. I'll hit the first game and then save for the finals. Any props you're targeting Calvary's? No, for this game, I, I basically, I, I did an episode um, with the prop doctor, Dr. Nick, and then with Sean Kerner, and I wanted to pick his brain a little bit on, you know, all the three-point variants. Do you see uh, the three-point ladder play for any of the Alabama perimeter players? And essentially, he was looking in at the way that UConn defends and does not give up a whole lot of open threes. And for that reason, he actually thinks that it's a pass for him in terms of those numbers. I was... I was hoping he'd say, oh, let's look at Sears at three or more threes and see if there's some value there. But the fact that he kind of talked me off that, that's enough for me to pass. All right, good stuff. And uh, this episode is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped, this season. Make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and take advantage of our special offer. Go to Manscaped 
dot com and use code BBOC for 20% off plus free shipping. They've introduced the Seasons Champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. And spring cleaning doesn't just apply to the nether regions. Get the full grooming experience with their signature Beard Hedger Pro Kit plus Handyman Electric Face Shaver. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BBOC at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code BBOC at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. But that'll do it for us. Hopefully we get some good Final Four games. Make sure you check out the Action Network app. We'll have all of our props there. BBOC Live, 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Actually, I think it'll be in the afternoon. Stay tuned on X. We'll tweet that out. We'll have our live show with, uh, I think, either Kerner or Giffen. Make sure you check out the Discord as well. And then we will be back for one final episode for the national title, which we'll record Sunday night. But that'll do it for us. Good luck in the final four. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe, tell friends, tell an enemy. Thanks to Mike and Mike. Thanks to our producer on the back end, David. Thanks most importantly to all of you for tuning in. And leave a review, five-star review. doesn't matter what you say. I promise. Giveaways, here's three. Uh, TJ TJTesQ, loved your March Madness breakdown. Thanks. Five-star review. You get some gear. Email podcast at actionnetwork.com. Or reach out to myself or our producer, Matt Mitchell, at old boy Uncle Mitch on Twitter. How about Rob wins one? I don't like anything these guys say, but I want some free stuff. The bad beat hotline is gold during football season. Five stars. That's it. You don't need to like what we say. Five stars. Rob wins. Reach out. You get some gear. Already can't wait for football to return. And for the bad beat hotline. And one more. Uh, let's do M. Dunlow. Excellent pod. Must listen for college ball. That's it. It's that easy. Uh, so those really help us out. I'll do more giveaways, as always, uh, throughout the season. And Cal Brees, when when is... uh? After Monday, we'll be done with college basketball and college football. Then we're on this channel, we'll have uh, college baseball. Do you know the the schedule for that? It's going to heat up um, in later April. We'll start to have you know the the weekend previews um, as we get into college World Series season. They're going to talk through the power rankings for Colin Wilson as well as the futures market. That way, you can build your portfolio in a smaller time horizon than we did for college basketball. But hopefully, you head into the tournament. And you have, you know, four or five teams that you can target to be able to spread out some of that risk because it's so interesting. College baseball, the number one seeds always are doomed. It's so rare for the top overall seed to get to the title game, let alone win it. So there's always value in those teams, you know, outside the top five. Yeah, I already saw Colin putting in I wouldn't Arkansas today. I'm assuming he's an Arkansas future. So come join for your uh, Arkansas fill, as I'm sure you'll get. Uh, but those episodes should be good. Make sure you check out our payoff pitch. Those guys do a great job of baseball uh, as the grind begins there. But thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Enjoy the final four. And we will see you guys Saturday for BBOC Live and Monday for the national title breakdown. Have a good weekend. Cheers. Cheers.